Hey, what's up, you? Uh, I just wanted to share a little bit about the volume profile. Uh, I've made some pretty significant improvements in my trading in the past uh, couple months, and I would attribute a lot of that to my my understanding of the profile and being able to apply it in my trading. And um, if, if you haven't read the book Mind Over Markets, that's where a lot of this uh, content comes from. I highly, highly recommend it. It is the best book I've ever read on trading, um, and I would sincerely recommend it to everybody. Uh, but with no further ado, let's get right into it. So what is the volume profile? I mean, simply, it just judges the amount of volume or the amount of contracts or shares traded at a particular price. Um, so we can look at this profile right here. Actually, let's bust out the five minute chart. No, nope, not that one. Okay, I had it up, but I uh, must have must have uh, been editing my charts or something. So um, in any event, uh, this is the volume profile here and we're looking at the NASDAQ. Uh, this is the futures market, not the not the stock. Um, in any event, so like I said, the volume profile shows the amount of trading that happen at each particular price and it's valuable because you can see where there's levels like when the market is in balance right here for instance this is called the POC it's where the the most trading took place during the uh, the day session uh, I have my market broken up to separate the the US session you know the RTH um, which is it starts I'm in Pacific time so it's 630 to about two o'clock um, and, um, basically, yeah, so you can, you can see, you can establish value basically. So the, the area or the POC where the most trading took place, um, that is the fairest value, so to speak for this particular, uh, security. Um, so right now you can see we're kind of above value. Um, and one thing that you can, that you can use is, um, you want to avoid trying to buy in the hole or sell in the hole. And what I mean by that is anytime you're, you're buying above value, uh, you're essentially buying in the hole or you're, you know, you're paying more for it than the, than the fair value is basically. So if you were somebody that's trying to flip cars or something and the, the fair value for the car is 10 grand and you're paying 12 while well, you're buying in the hole. Um, so one thing that can be helpful is these high volume nodes, uh, as they're called, they tend to work kind of like magnets. Price is going to be attracted to those levels because it has traded it there, you know, with significant volume before. Um, so it, it definitely likes to revisit those levels. And then concurrently, you've got low volume nodes. These are price rejection areas. So um, they're, they're deemed as being unfair value. And um, when, when low volume nodes are approached, basically they, they kind of work like a balloon. You know, the skin of the balloon is gonna provide some support or resistance, but once the balloon pops, it rushes through really, really quickly. So um, that, that can be really helpful because say you're, you're trying to get long on a pullback or something like that, uh, you can see we've got the high volume node here, and then we've got somewhat of a low volume node, you know, uh, on the underside here. I mean, that's the truest example right here. But in any event, what I would be doing is I would be waiting for price to, to break up. And you can see how we've got a low volume node here, and it provided resistance. So we got some rejection, and if I was looking to get long off the pullback, I would put my order down here in the low volume node because this area is bound to create support. So you can see this little red dash, like that's kind of where I would be putting my order. Anytime I have a high volume node and I'm trying to, um, you know, get long, for instance, um, I'm always fading the underside. I never, I really, really try to avoid buying up here because you've got nothing to lean on. So um, if price, if you were to sit, put your order in right here, well, um, you have the high volume node, which is gonna be like a magnet. So it's likely to trade through your order and shop around in this area for a little bit, you know, um, cause this is like, I, I try to think of these as traffic jams, uh, high volume nodes, and then low volume nodes are like freeways. So anyways, um, we've got our, our traffic jam here 
and then I would I would put my low volume node, or excuse me, my order just just shy of this low volume node again because it provides support. And then we take off, and you can see how the volume really picked up as we um, rushed right through this this uh, low volume area right here. So it can be really helpful. Um, what else? So one thing that I really like to use is um, using the prior days profile in order to assess, um, you know, what the what I think the market's trying to do. I know developing a bias, especially for beginner traders, is really really difficult, um, and and the volume profile allows us to. Uh, establish value and and find those imbalances that we can capitalize on much easier so one thing I'll do is I'll look at the prior days range and I will see where we're opening so again this is the RTH session the day session for the US and then this is the prior days day session and then this is the um, overnight right in here so Typically, and this this day is a little bit of an anomaly, um, particularly because we had this huge drop the day prior. Um, but normally, when you open up in the prior day's value area, um, you know your nothing has really changed. So this, you know, we've got the POC right here, and here's the value area. Um, the value area is, if you didn't know, is like 68% of um, the where the volume, where 68% of the volume was traded on the day, um, and that's just a mathematical formula. I I don't believe it truly establishes value. Um, true value, so to speak, I would say, is just this high volume node, you know, because that's I mean this is where the most most was traded uh, during the day, so both buyers and sellers agreed that this was a fair price. Um, in any event, so it's just one thing to look at because you know you've got you've got your value area high up here, but this isn't really value, so to speak. Um, this you know buyers and sellers were not agreeing that this was a good price or an equilibrium price. It was really not until we got down here that we started to chop around quite a bit, and there was a lot more volume traded. Um, and, the, and the market slowed down. So that's just one thing to keep in mind. Like I said, these the value are high and low. I will use them for key levels because people tend to trade around them. Um, but uh, the you know the 68 percent thing I just feel is a little bit arbitrary, uh, and I don't think it truly describes uh, value, um, particularly in this profile where it's very thin on a on a trend day. Um, whereas, you know, down here on a much more balanced profile, it might be more accurate in any event. So I look at where the market opened and, um, right, that's probably, it's hard to tell right here, but it's probably right here about 11, 7, 18 looks like normally if I see that the market is opening up in the priorities value area, then like I said, nothing, in my opinion, nothing has really changed. Um, and I, I don't expect there to be any really big moves on that particular day. Now, like I said, this day is an anomaly, although we open up in value, um, suggesting that nothing had really changed. Uh, we, we broke out really, really strong to the downside. Um, so you can, you can see right here we tested higher, and there was strong rejection, um, and then we immediately reversed, and this was it's called an open test drive. So we open, we tested higher, uh, we couldn't find buyers, and then it just dumped and drove drove to the downside. So, um, yeah, but my the point I was trying to make is normally if we open up in value, it, the market is, is in balance. And you know, on those days, I find they're more, more typically um, tend to be neutral days, a lot of chopping around, um, ranging, that kind of stuff. Now, if we open up... Um, out of range. Let's see if I can find a, a decent example here. Okay, so this. Uh, let's see. This will this will work. So we so we opened up in range here. Um, it looks like we opened up right there, and then this is the prior days range. And you can see this this uh, the range on this day was really really tight, um, and um, 
and then like I said the overnight session we didn't we didn't see a breakout although we were testing the downside when the market opens up within range but not in value then the market is out of balance but um, just just a little bit more than had it opened up in value so uh, anytime that the market opens up out of balance that is where you're going to have um, the greater risk but also greater opportunity if you're opening up in value lower risk but lower opportunity so um, you know and, and typically when um, when we open up like say if there's a gap I will always try to trade in the direction of the gap um, although sometimes you might get a really big gap and then the market will try to fill it um, there's kind of a um, a theory that the the market doesn't like gaps and it and it always tries to fill them well I don't agree with that um, I believe if I remember the statistics um, that I've looked at uh, gaps tend to get filled like 38 percent of the time or 40 40 percent of the time uh, which is not a not a huge number so um, the gap is kind of a it's like an invisible spike uh, you know where like right here is a really really big spike uh, we've got a very thin profile and it's super aggressive well a gap works in the same way but it's just you know quote unquote invisible spike um, and anytime you have a spike that's uh, indicating that there is aggressive um, they call them other time frame traders uh, that's an it's an older term from back in the the you know pit days in the 80s and 90s and stuff um, other time frame traders are, are nowadays mostly just your like position traders you know they trade on higher time frames and and very large sizes and they're the people that actually move the market um, so yeah like I said anytime you've got an imbalance I, t I tend to try to trade in the direction of the imbalance unless the market becomes responsive um, to that imbalance so you get a huge gap down or something um, and uh, the, you know the market might become responsive trying to you know wanting to buy at, at, a, at a lower price or getting a good deal um, so like I said if we gap I'll usually monitor you know for like 15 to 20 minutes something like that see if the market becomes responsive if it doesn't I always trade in the direction of the gap so um, but yeah back to where we were, we're talking about so we opened up barely within the prior days range um, and considering how close we were to the low I think it's very feasible to assume that we would we would test this low and and sure enough we we broke through the bottom and this this just happened to be at the top of a very very long um, and persistent uptrend and uh, it was just a, a massive massive sell-off so um, let's see here so on this day this is a good ex example of responsive um, activity so this is our close on the RTH um, right here okay and then we opened right here on the following day so we gapped up right um, and uh, you know normally I would try to trade in the direction of the gap but in this instance the market was definitely responsive you can see very aggressive activity coming in right off of the open uh, this is called an open drive where the market just opens and then just has very aggressive uh, directional conviction basically um, so yeah this this is this is helpful uh, again when you open out of balance greatest risk greatest opportunity so if you caught this short man you must have had a pretty good day um, but uh, yeah so that's that's one thing that can be really helpful opening up out of range uh, like I said um, just uh, watch you know use your best judgment uh, based on the size of the gap watch to see if the market becomes responsive and tries to fill the gap um, if they do that gap because it's a spike and it um, an invisible spike and it was caused by position traders or other time frame traders the base of that spike is going to provide some support or resistance so um, in this instance it didn't really that's our level right there 
and it looks like the market just traded right through it. Um, granted, it's a 15-minute bar, so I can't really tell what happened um, between it. But normally, the the base of the spike uh, or the you know the gap, the prior day's close, um, that will provide support or resistance. You know, depending on which direction uh, you're trading in. Let's look at some more examples here. Okay, so on this day, we had a gap up. So this is a perfect example. Um, we closed right here at the end of the RTH. We reopened right here, gapping up. And um, if you got long right off of the open here, I mean, it was great. We took out the overnight high right off the bat. Um, had a little bit of retracement back to VWAP, and then we started to, to push higher. Um, and um, yeah, so this is a, a really good textbook example of, of how to trade a gap. Um, let's see. Oh, and on this day, we opened up, yep, yeah, out, of, out of range entirely. So not only um, did we gap up from the, the prior day's close, but we're entirely above the, the prior day's range. So. Um, yeah, really, really solid. All right, so let's see RTH opening here. And okay, so this day was also, uh, we opened up out of range, looks like. Or, uh, can't tell if that bars. This looks like it might be RTH. Okay, so we opened up in range on this day, but just, just barely. So again, we're, we're out of, out of balance. Um, to to a degree, I mean we're we're just on the on the edge of the value area, so um, but yeah, I would I would still be looking to to trade long um, just because uh, the overnight session was still showing aggression, uh, and then we retraced to the kind of the top of the range, which is usually going to provide support and blah blah blah. Uh, let's see, I want to find something a little bit more confusing. All right, so this is a perfect example of the days where I will typically choose not to trade. Um, so here is the prior RTH and the following day. So um, you can look at, I mean, the volume on this is just pathetic. Um, you know, even on this day is 600 K. Uh, it's, it's very, very weak. Um, and then this day at four, 400 K for the RTH. Uh, it's just, it's just pathetic. You know, um, if I were to show you the, let's see, where are we at here? I was to show you, yeah, so that's 782K, and then uh, that was Thursday, and then about a million. Um, so, yeah, basically, um, it's just it's just really, really weak volume. And why, why is that exactly? Because nothing has changed. Um, we are opening up in the prior day's value area and not on the edge or just in range, but we're like right in the middle of it. So the sentiment uh, is still the same. Um, and like I said, we're, we're opening up in the prior day's value area. So we're in balance. And on these days, the market is really likely just to chop around a whole lot, you know? Um, and um, I will typically, you know, if we're, if we're opening up in value like that, um, apart from the one anomaly that I showed you in the very beginning, uh, I will typically try to either only trade outside in. So from the profile extremes back to the POC, profile extreme back to the POC, um, or I'll just not trade. So um, it's hard not to as well. I'm not very good at sitting on my hands, but um, yeah, that's that's the direction that I, I tend to move in. So. What else we got here? Um, can't. Uh, looks like we opened up right about here, so just barely in the prior day's range. Um, so yeah, the market opened up. Well, let's see. Are we in the value? Yeah, we're we are. We're just barely in value there. So again, we, you know, it's not super surprising. We had somewhat of a of a neutral day, um, and uh, looks like we opened tested and then we we got rejection moved lower found buyers there and then we just moved into an open auction um there's something called the initial balance and it's the first hour of trading uh which kind of sets the stage for the day it's called the initial balance 
um, and you can you can look at the IB and you can tell a lot of things from it. Um, for instance, a, a wide IB is typically going to indicate a, um, a trend day, which is, I mean, to be honest, it's like 5% of all days or trend days. Um, or it's going to indicate a neutral day. Uh, a neutral day is basically where it's just kind of um, ranging, you know, or there's, there's neutral center where you have a neutral day and it closes in the center. Then you have a neutral extreme day where it's uh, ranging a lot, but then it closes on the high or the low. So um, on a neutral day, basically the, the other time frame buyers and sellers, uh, neither one can really, uh, you know, garner control. Um, although, like I said, on a neutral extreme day where it closes on the high or the low, which we've had a lot of lately, um, that usually indicates that, you know, the other time frame buyer won or, or whatever. So, um, and then other, other examples with a medium sized initial balance, um, you know, it, it typically leads to like a normal day or a normal variation day. Um, a normal day is where I believe you kind of like take out one of the initial balance, uh, either take out the higher, higher low of the initial balance, uh, and then you, the market just kind of stops and then just ranges around. Um, and, um, anyways, there's, there's all these day types. You can look them up there. They go over them in mind over markets as well. And, and I'm sure there's stuff about them on YouTube. So, um, and then if it's a narrow initial balance, a narrow initial balance will typically either turn into a non-trend day, um, meaning the market just has like no conviction. You'll see these a lot right before major news releases or holidays in the market. Really just, you know, there's no structure to it at all. And those days you really, really want to avoid. Um, like, uh, I mean, look at the value area for this overnight session. Um, the value area is tiny, you know, and, um, I mean, this is, it's probably more of a, a neutral day, I would say. Um, although we had this weird anomaly in the profile up here. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, I would probably recommend not trading here just cause look how tight the range is, you know, I um, mean, yeah, it's very low risk cause you know, you're probably not going to get taken out by some huge move, but uh, the opportunity is just, is not there whatsoever. So, um, and then the other instance that, uh, a narrow IB will typically create is called a double distribution day. Um, and that's where you have a profile. Let's see if I can find us an example. Um, looking for a double distribution. I mean, not really seeing a good example. This is this is kind of one. Um, I mean, you know, granted, it's it's a little bit choppy looking, but normally you'll have a, like kind of a B shape. You know what I mean? Um, and uh, so when you have a, a, a double dis double distribution day, you know, the market will open with a very narrow IB and it will chop around quite a bit. But then eventually something will change. Uh, you'll get a breakout, and then the market will move to a new level, and then chop around up there, which creates that B shape on the profile. Um, so that's you know with a narrow initial balance, it's really really easy to take it out. Um, so um, that's why you'll you'll commonly get that. It'll just trade through it really aggressively, stop everybody out, and then move the market to a new level, and then it'll continue to consolidate. So. Um, anyways, I've got some other resources here for you guys. Um, I will post the link in the comment section or in the description. Um, so this is a flow chart on, um, developing your, your market bias. So, uh, you just, you know, you ask yourself, is the, the market opening in range or is it opening out of range? Um, and then you know, you just kind of follow it along. So is the market responsive? Yes or no. If it's yes, fade the gap back into balance, you know, watch for the bounce at the retest of the prior days range and the prior days value area. Is the prior range holding? Yes. The fade is no longer valid. And if, if, um, if you don't know what fade means, it means to like counter basically. Um, so the, the, you know, shorting back into the, um, priorities range, you know, on the, from the gap 
that's no longer valid and it's just now trade back in the direction of the imbalance and monitor for continuation and the reason why you do that why you trade it that way is because if you have a let me see if i can get drawing tool here so um if you have a market where's my pointer i can't even see it because the white background <laughs> let me find something with black hang on thanks for sticking with me guys um all right so if you have a a market let's say we got this and then we got this something like that so you've got your profile okay that's day one and then you've got um day two you're opening right here okay so let's say the market went something like that okay and that's where it closed all right and this is where we're opening um so basically and this so if this is like the value area so this is again this is the fairest price for the security for for or the most recent assessment of what fair value is right so if we open up out of balance like that then something has changed and um, position traders are moving the market uh, out of balance because they think that this is no longer value right so let's say the market wants to fill this gap right so as we reapproach this level um, the market is going to find resistance here why because this was value but the market has decided no that's that's not that's not uh, what we think this is worth anymore. We think it is worth less and a gap down. But as we approach this level here, um, the market is going to find resistance. Why? Because they said, no, this is, this is not value. Um, you know, we decided that the, you know, the NASDAQ was worth less than this. So it'll often find a bounce right there. You know, um, so a lot of gaps will fill and then immediately continue in the direction of the imbalance. Um, however, let's say it did find buyers and it starts trading into the prior days value area. Well, sometimes you'll get a bounce, but I use the battering ram principle. The more times you bang on a wall, uh, the more likely it is to break down. So eventually, um, you know, it'll provide a lot of resistance on the first spike. But subsequent spikes are fair game, basically. So if you if you gap and then you trade back into the day's value area, it is um, much more likely to trade all the way through it. Okay, that's called the value area rule. So just to reiterate, if the market opens out of balance and then trades back into the prior day's value area, it is more likely to trade all the way through it. So especially if it's a narrow range. Um, anyways, I am out of time, but, um, I hope this was helpful. I really, really like this stuff and it's, it's made a, a pretty big impact in my trading. So, um, I hope you'll pick it up. And, uh, again, like I said, I want to really thank, uh, Jim Dalton who wrote mind over markets the guys, uh, uh, he's a wizard as far as I'm concerned. So his book is, has really done a lot for me and, and I really appreciate, uh, his contribution to the trading community. So, uh, thank you so much for watching and, uh, we'll see you next time.